actually, the, so the title of the talk was originally uh, Subvolume APIs, and I decided that might not really be enough for its own talk, but really there's more to talk on about on file system APIs, and I want to spend some of the time just gathering up whatever ideas we have, seeing what, what common ideas they have and what comes out of that. So I'm going to go over, over the stuff that I've got, but if you have things to, suggestions that would, you know, things that we might want to flesh out, APIs that we might want to standardize, cool things that we, cool things that we can do. Uh, this is where I want to start out with a short list of notes and come out of the talk with a longer list of notes. Uh, I'm probably not going to be implementing all this stuff myself. In fact, I can practically guarantee you that I won't. Uh, Thomas is already jumping on some of this stuff. Uh, if you're interested in working on this stuff, I will be coordinating that work, helping to make sure the patches go in, et cetera, et cetera. So, subvolumes. Uh, the, the genesis of this was starting to work on uh, per subvolume disk space accounting and BcacheFS, and realizing the first thing we need is just a way to iterate over subvolumes. Uh, there was some back and forth. Al had an interesting idea about an API for iterating that returns a file descriptor to each open subvolume. That was crazy and cool, and it would kind of fit well with the open at system calls. I don't think that's the direction that we'll end up going because I, came, I realized there's a, a simpler approach, but I just thought it was cool. Uh, the thing that I hit on that seems really slick is what if we just added a flags parameter to our open Dirk uh, syscall? Dirk always says that we everything should have a flags parameter, and it turns out we do. Yes, finally. <laughs> if we have a flags parameter, then the default can be just normal iterating over dur uh, durants in the current directory. Then we have, can have a flag for iterating over child, child subvolumes that gives you the path of the subvolume relative to the current subvolume root, and a third flag for iterating over submounts. Why not have a real API for iterating over submounts? I gather that there's user space people that would already like this, and I've been noticing just today, especially, that uh, subvolumes and mounts have a lot in common in what user space wants to do with them, so why not start to look at ways we can consolidate and standardize, standardize those APIs? So that's the first thing we need, is just an API for iterating. Uh, Derek brought up that we also, it would be really nice to have a better way of iterating over extended attributes. We're starting to work with more and more extended attributes. so. I think that might end up slotting in really nicely with this API. And it ends up being short and slick, and then we'll just have a nice way of iterating over. I mean, our, our existing get dense uh, syscall is nice and well optimized and clean. Let's just use that for extended attributes, too. So another thing that just came up is we also are going to need some more statX extensions. We've already got, see up there, uh, STX volume, volume ID. Uh, that lets you know if you are, are in the uh, subvolume root, which subvolume you're in. We're also going to need another flag for is this a snapshot so that eventually core utils can, by default, probably ignore your, your, all your snapshots so that you aren't, when you're recursing over the entire file system, you don't want to see the same file over and over and over again in all your backup snapshots. So we need to get that in. Uh, continuing the theme of uh, subvolumes and uh, mounts are similar. Yeah, so that would be. 
Okay, so a snapshot is a type of subvolume. A subvolume is a fancy directory. So that would be your iterate by subvolumes. And then you would check per subvolume which one is a snapshot. Yeah, that, this will directly translate to the new opener get debts. So continuing with the theme that uh, subvolumes and uh, mount points are actually have a lot in common, uh, we have statfs. Uh, everything that statfs returns, we would like to be able to query that per subvolume as well. Uh, disk space accounting. Uh, and also number of inodes. I don't know if ButterFS does that currently. Does ButterFS, anyone know if ButterFS does number of inodes per subvolume? We already have a sort of mechanism doing that. With, uh, with uh, XFS and project quotas, we use directory trees and so on. And so the yeah, that's, of it is, that's project ID though, isn't it? Right, but the actual thing that it will do is we pass a dentry to our stat, statfs or you know, whatever the internal mm -hmm. interface is. Um, and that is then used to look up the project ID and it grabs the disk usage and inode count from the project ID information inside the <laughs> file system and reports that in the statfs code rather than the global file system stuff. So realistically, you don't, you can already do... We, we don't need do, a new syscall. You don't need a new syscall for that. All you need to do is look at the dentry that is passed to you and, you know, infer the subvolume or whatever you're working on from the inode attached to the to the dentry. Okay, is this going to be a weird XFS thing that if we do everywhere, the user space is going to get confused by, or should we consider adding a new flag to make this explicit? Uh, no, because the <laughs> DF, Derek's laughing like, back like, there. Like, as far as I'm aware, DF actually reports the the um, the the directory tree root. Yeah, so the dentry that is passed down is the directory tree root, as I understand it. Yeah, and yeah. And so DF is actually reporting not the mount point of the file system, but the directory tree root. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm talking about all the existing usages. Like some user types DF in their home directory and expects that to return DF for the entire file system, but now this would switch that to reporting on just the subvolume, if I follow. Oh. Uh, Yes, that would be the, the case, but I mean, realistically, when you type in DF, you're giving it a path no. to begin with. I feel like that, that needs to be bike shed. I, I, I have to, for yeah. I don't but, have an opinion. But on what that, I'm yeah. saying is we already have a dentry being yeah. passed down, which you yeah. can use to derive that information from. Why, why, why not just do a status FS flag syscall and then make this explicit? That'll be a pretty trivial condition. I don't know whether we need a new syscall. <laughs> yeah, I think we could do a new syscall. This is gonna be a couple new syscalls. Let's just do them all at the same time. So that gets us disk usage, number of inodes. Uh, before we move on to the next section, does anyone else have anything related to snapshots and subvolumes? So I think that like, you know, we're, we're kind of talking about different things that we want or whatever. I, having done this for a little while and having to deal with new interfaces, I would prefer that we sort of focus on things that we already currently do. Like, I think that the open door thing for sub list is really good, because like, you have a sub list, I have a sub list. So apparently Samba has a sub list. Like, if we can come up with unique, you know, things that we already provide. I, I feel like it can be really helpful to just write down our ideas and our wants, even, we, that should come with the expectation that not everything we want is going to happen. Sure. There's okay. an infinite amount of work, not all of it will get done. That's fair. Uh, right. But collecting ideas and just seeing where the, the same ideas pop up over and over again, I, I like to get that down. Okay, agreed. So there's a, there's a very common use case that, I don't know a good way to do this in Linux, but it's common on other OS. And you know, an example might be that you know, you've got this video and 
you did a snapshot when you woke up in the morning and you did a snapshot the night before and so you, you know what the video looked like yesterday and the day before. But you don't really feel like mounting your whole snapshot. What you, you just want to open that one file, the, the earlier copy. Mm -hmm. So other OS have, you know, you can pass in on open, you can pass in the snapshot info. So you can open just one file, different versions of the same file without having to like traverse through all the different snapshot volumes and all that. I don't know how you do that in Linux. What yeah, I do is yeah. I just do a read-only mount of snapshots into some other directory. Yeah. And with the read-only mount, I let them look at you know the older o open versions. Open this but file as of a week ago. Yeah. And so basically, I'm showing them a read-only version of the whole volume a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. So I, I have these read-only mounts, and that's fine. But the, I think that the more natural way is the way other OS do it, where they also allow an app to say, I just want to look at this one video, yesterday's version or last month's version, rather than having to mount the yeah, whole yeah, snapshot yeah. volume. I, I don't think that needs to be its own syscall. That that feels kind of awkward to me as a syscall. We're pass, we'd have to pass in a, a fair amount of stuff. But in order to do that in user space library code, we need some standardized way of finding uh, the... Okay. Oh, you talking about like Waffle? Pardon? How Waffle does it? Yes. Yeah. And, and then in each of those dates, you then have the version of that directory <coughs> at that date. That's, that's a very different model. Like ButterFS and VCacheFS don't constrain where snapshots live or any kind of layout like that. But we, we need to figure out some way of providing that structure. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I mean, as a user per space person, I find this really weird, the open deer thing for enumerating subvolumes already, because, I mean, it's a, uh, okay, finish that. Okay. Because, like, um, I don't know, I personally find open deer in many ways a terrible API already in itself, because uh, it gives you the file name, and then you have to open it, and the information doesn't necessarily match up. So, so I way well, much prefer APIs where we actually get a file descriptor of the stuff that we enumerate, right? So that uh, there's no chance that um, what I'm looking at now is going to be different than after I opened it, right? Time, time of check to time of use yeah. race. So you're like an Al's idea? Where which which I, is? I, a get dense like thing that returns a file descriptor to each object instead of the name of the object. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a file descriptor as the object itself. It could be opass or something, or something that behaves I, like opass. But uh, um, I like that so much better. Don't, I think OpenDeer is a terrible API. Okay. And that's the other uh, issue, like, you know, OpenDeer is designed right now, or like at least what user space generally expects, that it lists file names, meaning things that do not have, contain a slash. But subvolume path, um, they do contain um, slash, right? Like they can be at any level down, so that would feel really weird. It's it's different, but this is something that you explicitly opt into with the new flag. So if you if you get it, it's because you're expecting it. But still, it seems like you're shoehorning something very different uh, into no, something no. that you, that like. And then the other thing is like, as far as I know, struct DRN, the way it's defined in user space, like the file name has a fixed size, like 255 or something like this. So suddenly, a subvolume pass can be much longer, right? Like because again, ten ten levels down. So this is like doesn't to me it doesn't fit in any way. And I'm pretty sure that from user space, like I wouldn't want to have that. I, I want the file descriptor based stuff. I, w I was just looking at the syscall, and maybe I didn't look deeply enough, but there is a, a name length field uh, for the list of durants that we return. Sure, but I mean it. it like it depends. Like. Um, it, it really depends, like because there's like if you get the get dense, then you get this packed array um, back. Yeah, but yeah. still, user space um, sometimes allocates the struct dear end on the on the stack, and for that it has a fixed size 255 or something like this. And like like yeah, that's so there's a mismatch, like how user space currently uses it and, and what you want there. That, okay, and, that that could maybe warrant a new type. But again, like to, from my perspective, is like I want FD based APIs for everything. Don't give me file name based stuff. That's that's yeah, stuff we yeah. want to present to the user. It's not something that we ideally want to use as a handle for for referring S to stuff. File handles instead. 
like, yeah, that, like that, NFS perfect. files. That, that would, oh, that, oh, you mean the, the that would be fine too. Open file descriptors, we do, so, so maybe instead of open file descriptors, we do just hand out file handles because those should be, yeah. you, you should be able to guarantee okay, those. Yeah, that's way better. Yeah. Uh, I'll take yeah. that or, file, or, or like FDs, fine by me. Just file names I don't like. Just one comment to iterate over mounts. We introduced a new 64-bit mount ID. I, I think you're aware of this. And we have the uh, list mount system call, which already lets you iterate over mounts. But you, don't, you get mount IDs back. So sorry, we have sorry. we have a 64-bit mount ID now. So mm -hmm. the mount ID is unique over the lifetime of a system, and we have the list mount system call that's already upstream, and so you can iterate over uh, mounts, child mounts. Mm -hmm. Start from a mount point, you get all of the uh, child mount points, uh, and uh, you get the IDs of the mount points mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. The thing that we are basically missing is uh, a way to go from these um, mount IDs to a file descriptor, like if you wanted to do that. Yeah, it's it, it's easy to implement. So could we just no? Because a file handle is specific to a, a file system. Uh, we were talking about that in context of firm links earlier. I'm I want, I'm planning on stealing uh, firm links from APFS. Uh, for those who don't know, a firm link is in between a soft link and a hard link. It points to an inode number. Uh, much like a hard link, but it does not bump IM link, which fixes a lot of the issues with hard links where they break uh, recursive uh, enumeration. You see that like, user space rsync has to go through a lot of contortions if hard links are in use. Uh, and unlike a soft link, uh, they avoid a lot of the overhead on lookup, and they still return enoent if the target has been deleted. But we realize that firm links should really to a file handle and probably a file system UUID as well. So and a file system UUID is a stable identifier across reboots. That, that happens to be the pointers that OverlayFS uses, like UUID and, and file, file handle, handle? Okay. With, with the index feature to do resolving of file handles from so maybe we should be standardizing this file system UEID. You could, you could look thing. into it, uh, but. I like that. Uh, that seems to be coming up in a lot of places. In time. So there were some things that came up in the previous couple days about other things that we, that are missing with respect to file handles. Uh, we have, I believe, file handle to dentry internal to the kernel, but I, it sounds like file handle to path is missing as a syscall. Which one? File handle to path. OK. It exists, but you, you can only reliably get path for directory. Yes. For file, you may not get a path yes. or get an Again, because, path. because hard links suck. That too. That and, and non-connectable non uh, uh, files as well. Okay. Some files cannot simply get yeah. uh, All the file handle discussion dovetails nicely with inode number uniqueness. It is getting increasingly impractical to guarantee inode number uniqueness. Uh, in bcachefs, we try to do shard inode numbers uh, according to CPU ID that takes some bits, and then there's a subvolume ID that takes more bits. With the numbers of inodes that people are already hitting today, we really cannot guarantee uh, unique inode numbers in 64 bits. And I don't like kicking cans down the road. We need to be nudging user space to switching to file handles for uniqueness detection, detection sooner rather than later. And we had a kerfuffle recently, shame Stephen Rostat isn't in the room, uh, where it turns out uh, having a file system return all zeros for the inode number breaks lots of things. That's, that's just going to happen more and more later if we can't guarantee inode number uniqueness. So I was thinking maybe we should add, say, amount options so that people can sh start to shake out those sorts of bugs where we actually do intentionally report, report the same inode number 
for every file in the file system. What would the syscall do? No, no, a syscontrol. A sys oh, a syscdl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's better than a mount. That's better than a mount option for this. Yeah, I think the other thing here is if you really want to get user space to move to file handles, it's going to be important to make this be a cross OS initiative um, because unlike those people who like to believe that all the world runs Linux, um, a lot of user space uh, maintainers will say, but I need to make sure my software works on Mac OS, FreeBSD, yada, yada, yada. And so if we think we can sort of get file handles to be something that can be supported by other more forward-leaning um, POSIX-like file uh, operating systems, uh, the chances that we'll be able to convert enough user space so that it is possible to return, you know, zeros for all I know numbers as opposed to random stuff breaking, um, you know, the chances of that happening will be much better. It will still be a multi-year effort, right? And mm -hmm. I think we all mm -hmm. need to accept the fact that it's going to be a multi-year effort. But given that it's going to be a multi-year effort, we might as well try to make this be something that's going to be generally adoptable uh, across more than just Linux. Do we know what the status is of file handle on other operating systems? Yeah, they may not have the yeah. They may not have the system calls to export it the way Linux does, but they will have some internal right. implementation of file handles. Yeah. Yeah. And this um, this inode number uniqueness is most common, I think. In you know, I've had to deal with it for 20 years, right? Because when you're dealing with mounting to 20 different operating systems, you know, SMB has to deal with you know 30 year old crap, right? So. And, there are and, a wide variety of operating systems that have to deal with it, screw up inode numbers. So the other place this comes up too, for those who aren't aware, because uh, UnionFS and network file systems both hit the issue where you're trying to export multiple source file right. systems as a destination file system, right. and their pigeonhole principle, you, you, it's no longer possible to guarantee yeah. inode And, and some, some servers do nice tricks to, to hash those together to figure out ways around it. Um, but not all servers do, and so servers have had bugs for years for this kind of yeah, thing, so I've had yeah. to deal with it for 20 years. So the best I could come up with years ago, and maybe other people had better ideas, was I tried to detect on the fly if the server or file system was broken. If I saw two inodes that, were, that had different types, that just implausible things, so I had certain checks, and if I detected that, I turned off trusting the inode number, and I would generate inode numbers that were temporary on the fly. So instead of setting zero, I would just generate a temporary inode number on the fly. When the inode was, f the memory was freed, you know, it went away, but at least it was better than t returning zero. Um, and that was the best I could come up with, and it's well, I've been we're, doing it for we're, 20 years. We're trying to get away from the need for those kinds of hacks. If we no, can, I, I agree, yeah. but what I'm getting at is returning zero doesn't work, but generating a no, random it's, number No, it's going to break everything, yeah, exactly. and that's the point. But generating an inode number that was random was how I had to work around it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other thing is uh, create a list of all the places. So one of the things that we found out the hard way um, was that the shared library loader depends on inode number uniqueness um, or things break <laughs> in really strange what? ways. And I found out about that the hard way. Um, and fortunately, VertIOFS has a there, inode a unification feature specifically to solve that problem. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's a story there that needs to be told. What? <laughs> yeah, um, it's a long story. I'll tell it over a bar maybe. But okay. the bottom line is, that was one that came as a total shock to me, that like yeah. the shared library loader cares about um, unique numbers because if it sees two shared libraries that have the same inode number, they assume that we can use the same memory region because it's obviously the same file, right? Yeah. If the dev t slash inode number is unique, 
excellent. And like, we had no idea until we tripped across it. And so, if, if we don't do this now, imagine what this is going to be like in 24 years when 64 bits is even more and more and more crammed. We're just going to be seeing the random weird shit. So this may seem like a lot right now, but if we do this right, we're just going to be providing tools so that other user space developers can start to shake out these bugs and we won't be doing most of the work ourselves. Yeah, I agree with Steve. Uh, having non-persistent inner numbers is less worse than having non-unique ones. Overlay has the, has the same uh, uh, fallback. All right. Any all? I think. Sorry. Anything else for inner numbers and file handles, or do we want to talk a bit about f-sync overhead? I mean, I, I think it's it's very hard to get rid of that. Like, as somebody from user space, he uses like this very often to determine uniqueness of inodes that we deal with. Right? This is going to be very, very hard. Um, I think uh, it's probably worth figuring out like why user space actually wants these things, and maybe uh, giving better APIs for these problems than yeah. trying to just um, let them do whatever they want to do just with a different yeah. ID. I because I want to hear more about like Ted's story because I, I cannot think of any reason why the dynamic linker would care about hard links whatsoever. So in Systemd we have a very similar case where we have a couple of resources that we load and uh, we don't want to um, load the same resources uh, 500 okay. times if okay. they are sim linked or uh, mounted to, to uh, various different places. So what we actually do is uh, we go by major uh, by DevT, uh, uh, by inot and um, identify. Uh, have the I already same processed cases. this resource? Sorry? Have I already processed this resource? Yeah, so exactly. Um, uh, and uh, like, it's very hard for us to get rid of this. Um, I don't know, like, but. Uh, uh, and also, the way people have been doing this kind of varies. Some places people will do it by just testing off the INO number, some places they'll, they'll include uh, dev T. It's, it's not like this is anything good that we're. We're deprecating and, no, and they, replacing. They have to include DevT for something serious because it could yeah. be a different file system. And that's one point. You don't really have to have unique inodes unless you have uniform dev. <coughs> and this is something that you need to. Say again, uniform. Uniform uh, ST dev, right? So oh, the thing is like that. Overlap has started with not having uniform ST dev, right? And bcachefs yeah. has uniform stdev, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to have uniform stdev, right? Uh, this, this is going to cause different sorts of problems, but the problems of non-unique sti I know are severe. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with that. Like, DevT I, is. <laughs> I know, I know. But, I mean, it I had to be said. Uh, from, from my user space perspective, uh, yeah, uh, dealing with non-uniqueness of DevT is way easier than from for I know T. Uh, Neil Brown considered non-uniqueness of ST Dev a major mistake, but I do not recall his reasoning. But I mean that 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 boat has sailed now. Everybody in user space kind of caught up already, or maybe didn't. But uh, um, I okay. think this, like, <laughs> built on that, as I would yeah. say. Well. I, I feel like so the SD dev I've, stuff I've is. I've got a question to you as a the token user space developer, which is um, the concept of using file handles is just simply we have more bits for yeah. uniqueness. Would if we had an approach that used file handles so that you could determine if two files were unique, what are the problems with that? Other than like OS portability, which you may or may not care about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think uh, file handles are great. Like, but I mean, the, so far we always have a problem that the that the the privileges that you needed to do them are different than what we uh, generally yes. expect. You need cap deck research. Yep. Uh, search, not research. Yeah, and that is a. So, but uh, it's still not implemented on all file systems, right? Like, I always need a fallback, right? Like, can I use it on ProcFS? So, so I cannot. But if, you, if, if I have ProcFS, if I have some weird file in ProcFS, then I, can I query for a file handle? I, well, it can be exported by a trace. No, 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 that's... Uh, 
we, we, we decoupled this some time ago to make it work for uh, the Fenotify UK use case. So, so I, added, I added a flag for the system call that's called at FID that returns you like the inode generation even if there are no decode operations. Just inode generation, which every file system has, even pseudo file systems have. Them. Oh, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. No, I told you. Also, so, but, um, uh, are there guarantees on how long a file handle actually is? Because the one of the things is like uh, people like uh, no, file again, file and handles a couple have to of projects which length. embed the inode. If they want to describe information about some something else, then they um, encode the the inode number in a file name, and that so it certainly works because file names can be 255 bytes long, and that's good. But file handles, they their length is unspecified. There's, not, there's a constant yes. now, it's pretty really small. And they, they can't it be specified. It could grow theoretically, but right now Yeah, but I mean, small. you basically would have to give the guarantee that these are kind of bounded by something that we can no, still. No, stacking file systems mean that you can't provide a bound. Sure, but that, that is kind of, kind of makes it very hard for people. Okay, but this kind of means like that user space, at least if they want to have an identifier, they need to know that when the size is large enough, they actually have to hash themselves so that they get 256 bits out of it or something. Or dynamically allocate. Yeah, but that makes it, it's, it's a string. Sure, I mean, I understand that, but still, I mean, in user space, we usually just want an identifier. We don't actually need the string. The kernel does need the, the string because it has open by handle add, right? But in user space, um, like, to actually use it, you have to tell people, don't just use the file handle data, hash it, and use that so that you have a fixed size thing that you can actually why, use. Why would you hash it? Then you're bringing back all the problems with hash collisions. Well, I mean, cryptographic hash, there are no problems with hash collisions. I mean, if, if there are problems with hash collisions, that you have much yeah, bigger problems. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, okay. yeah, I mean. If, it, if you're going doing a cryptographic hash, that's okay. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we don't want to export. That's, that's a different thing. Yes, yes. How are we on time? I was very scared at the beginning when you said the amount option to report all inode numbers as zero, but kind of makes sense. <laughs> uh, uh, if we have a way, going to explode yeah. when we do that, and that's the point. If you have a way to uh, uh, to reliably compare um, file handles, but that's something that we where we really need to start educating user space then, because I think most user space still thinks comparing inode numbers is is the way to go, and yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And e even ST, ST dev like ButterFS does for subvolumes, th there's too many ways to break that. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of what we do. Uh, we need to wrap up, but. All right. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, no, 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 no. K, K comp, so first of all, K comp is really shit. We had just had a story. We just had a discussion about this uh, a while ago. So uh, it's P trace based. You can do it on, on other objects. It's not something we should do. Let's add a dedicated system call. Oh, yeah, some containers block uh, open by hand, um, um, uh, name to handle add. So that's also a problem. Inside comp. <laughs> <laughs>